Good afternoon, everyone. The disciples of Jesus uh, found prayer to God a difficult thing. What to pray for? What are the priorities? So the Lord solved their problems by teaching them what we call the, the Lord's Prayer. And is that what we've just read in our introductory reading from uh, Matthew chapter 6? It established their priorities for them. God is the Father, the Provider, and his kingdom is to come on earth. And so we read there, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And for this talk this afternoon, I will focus on the coming of this kingdom. It's um, an address as, as part of a series um, which is being looked at on um, the kingdom of God. Um, and other um, addresses will actually talk um, about the kingdom. But what I'm going to do this afternoon is just actually focus on the coming of this kingdom and for what uh, um, Jesus was uh, telling his disciples to pray for. So, for the most part, uh, human beings act as though there is no creator and no purpose in the world around them. But they are without excuse, as the Apostle Paul, and he was a, a well-educated man of his time, and if we look at what he declares in Romans chapter 1, Uh, Romans chapter 1 and verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. And so if you look at the wonders of the human body, the miracles of plant life, the incredible wonders of living cells, if there is then a God, and he has a future for the human race, then surely he's told us well, yes, of course he has. And the whole Bible, from the beginning to the end, reveals his plans for the earth. He spoke to the fathers and through the prophets, and in these last days, by the Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. And that we are told in, in Hebrews. And this is why the gospel was the centre of Christ's ministry. And if we turn to that passage there in Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23, it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Now the kingdom of God was once before established on earth and the king David and his descendants who reigned upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord we are told in 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 5. We won't turn to that but that was a subject which was dealt with um, last week under this theme of uh, the kingdom of God. Now there was nothing special about the throne itself. The divine appointment was what mattered. And when king after king neglected God's laws, he brought that arrangement to an end. But even when the prophet Ezekiel announced the end of the kingdom to King Zedekiah, he promised that God would restore the kingdom on earth. And it was to be to him whose right it is. 
And that we are told there in that passage from Ezekiel chapter 21. So then, who is the one whose right it is? Well, it is Jesus, because this is what it says at his birth. How he shall be great, he shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. The second coming of Jesus to the earth has to be understood against the Old Testament background. When Jesus began his public ministry by announcing the kingdom of God was at hand, if we just turn to Mark chapter 1, and verse 15 it says and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand repent ye and believe the gospel he was saying to those who knew the Old Testament promises that he was the promised king but Jesus had first come to achieve personal righteousness to make it possible for others to become right with God. It's now possible for us to find peace with God through forgiveness of our sins by associating with the saving work of the Lord Jesus. But first we have to understand the gospel including the Bible teaching about the work and the person of the Lord Jesus and the kingdom over which he is to be king. And then we have to be baptised as believing adults into his saving name. But what is the second coming of the Lord going to be like? For example, would it be possible to miss it altogether? To not even be aware that it has occurred? Will it be something which is visible or invisible? Will Jesus be there in person or merely just a spiritual presence? And will he come to the earth? Well, Jesus Christ rose bodily from the grave. He was not an invisible spirit creature, but he was one who could be seen and handled and held. And so if we look at Luke chapter 24, Luke's Gospel record chapter 24, and verse 39 here it says behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself handle me and see for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have and when he had thus spoken he showed them his hands and his feet and his body was marked by the evidence of his suffering on the cross but he was no longer subject to the limitations of human existence. And we are told how he ascended bodily to heaven. And his disciples who had seen him go were told that he would return visibly. And if we turn to that passage there in Acts chapter 1. Here we are told very clearly. So Acts chapter 1, and we're going to just read from verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, 
Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Now we needn't turn to this passage, but uh, we're told in, told in Revelation chapter 1, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. So we're told quite clearly that it's going to be a visible return of Christ. Now we'll just turn to this passage uh, in Zechariah, uh, Zechariah chapter 12. So this um, Old Testament prophet here um, predicted this long before um, his cruci Jesus' crucifixion. So if we turn to Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So then the kingdom will not be something which is invisible or the presence of the Lord an invisible one. The New Testament also talks about the Revelation of the Lord using a word that means uncovering or manifesting. In fact, the presence, which is this Greek word here, parousia, of the Lord, is a, is a very special term. It's one suitable, um, if you read this um, extract here, how it became the official term for a visit of a person of high rank, especially of kings and emperors, visiting a province so it's an important word which is used there that word presence and it's such a visit by a king which is foretold in the scriptures and the crowds who welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem when he sat astride a donkey they threw coats and palm branches before him they shouted out greetings which referred back to the promises of God. Uh, if we look at Mark, I uh, keep your finger here actually in Zechariah because we're going to be coming back here in a second. Um, just turn to Mark chapter 11. Here it says, Mark chapter 11 and, and verse 10. Uh, we'll start from verse 7 actually there how they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him and he sat on him and many spread their garments in the way and others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them in the way and they that went before and they that followed cried saying Hosanna blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord Hosanna in the highest And Matthew uh, comments that the rejoicing was just a foretaste of what had been forecast by Zechariah the prophet when he wrote, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. And so if this initial visit was attended with such joy and rejoicing, we can only consider then what the next one will be like as declared in Zechariah. So if we just turn back into Zechariah now and, and verse 9. This is where this time is, is foretold for us here. Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. And I'll cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth. 
Now this scripture here illustrates a widely used feature of Bible prophecy. And that is a joint and short term fulfilment. Because Jerusalem, as we've seen, rejoiced at the coming of Jesus. As we read there, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the fall of an ass. Just as the prophet Zechariah here said. But their joy was to be short lived. Because he didn't then at that time go on to establish worldwide peace. Or to commence his rule from Jerusalem over a kingdom that would last forever. But what Jesus did do was he completed enough of this prophecy at that time. To demonstrate that he was the coming one. To give us confidence that he will return to complete the promised transformation of the earth. Now Zechariah puts these two um, comings of Christ um, together here in this passage. In such a way that there appears to be no interval between them. And what this has done is this has caused some people to argue that the kingdom will never come. Because they say even Jesus expected it in the first century or shortly after. But when the scriptures are studied it becomes clear that the coming of Jesus and the kingdom was not to occur immediately after his ascension to heaven. Because even Christ himself stated he didn't know the time appointed. And so when we turn to Matthew chapter 24. We are told there in verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. Know not the angels of heaven. But my father only. And Jesus was aware that some time was going to elapse. Before his second coming. And what he did is he actually told parables. To indicate that his coming would not immediately appear. And so in Luke chapter 19 there. We read because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He, he went on and, and gave this parable. And we're told there in Matthew that it was to be after a, a long time. So there was going to be um, a delay for those who were waiting. And so, like their Lord, his followers were to appreciate that they would not know the hour that he would come. The apostles, they too, also acknowledged that they could not know the precise time of the, this great event for which they waited. In fact, Peter warned about people who would scoff at uh, the promise of his coming. Paul was in no doubt either um, regarding uh, Christ's coming. If we look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and the opening verses there say but of the times and the seasons brethren ye have no need that I write unto you for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night so notice what this verse says then firstly there would be general indications available in what Paul calls times and seasons and these would help keep the believers prepared and then the verse continues that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night so when the Lord comes to establish the kingdom it will be swift it will be sudden and it will be unexpected no one expects thieves to strike but they often succeed because people overlook the dangers and so we must be on our guard we must be watchful we have to be prepared and we have to be vigilant because the Lord could come at any time when we least expect him 
And so for this reason, Jesus explained what would happen before his return. He very carefully emphasised the need for watchfulness. And sitting with his disciples one day on the Mount of Olives, and this was from where he would later ascend to heaven, he gave them some general indications of what would happen prior to his coming and the end of the world. Um, if we turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 and verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now this prophecy presents again um, a challenge for us because it combines a short-term prediction about the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple with a long-term forecast of world events. And we have a list of um, world events which are, which are predicted. And they come for us uh, in the Gospels. We find them in, in Matthew, in Mark and in Luke. And this isn't to be um, any sort of structured sequence that we've, we've put these uh, events up here. Um, they're in no particular order. But the things that um, are listed, they're events which show um, and, and point forward to the coming of Christ. And so we have the rise and fall, sorry, the rise of false Christianity and false Christ, we're told about. The persecution of true Christians. We're told of wars and rumours of wars, of nation against nation. We're told of earthquakes, famines and pestilences. Of Jerusalem surrounded by armies. We're told of the Jewish nation being dispersed. Of Jerusalem in non-Jewish occupation. We're told of tribulation and distress of signs in the sun, moon and stars and we're told of the powers of heaven which shall be shaken and so whilst we don't know the exact sequence of events and to this day we can't know for sure when Jesus will come in fact when the Lord speaks to his followers about his eventual return to the earth to set up the kingdom he focuses more on the consequence of his coming rather than the sequence of events themselves so when he comes he will call us to account he'll ask us how we spent our lives and so we read phrases in the scriptures such as take heed be not led astray be not troubled take heed to yourselves preach the gospel be not anxious Endure to the end, flee, pray, believe not false prophets, take heed, look up and lift up your heads, take heed to yourselves, watch and be ready. Now Jesus does advise us in general terms what the towns would be like prior to his return and establishment of the kingdom. And so reference is made to the, the sea and the waves roaring, signs in the sun, in the moon and in the stars. And this may be symbolic or it may be literal or it might have to be a combination of both. The prophet Isaiah wrote about the wicked being like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. And Jesus may have been drawing on such imagery to describe a world that was full of trouble because it was full of wickedness. He might also have been teaching us to look out for some upheaval of the physical order as well, like um, tidal waves. And we've certainly seen uh, those, haven't we, in, uh, in the world. Certainly there have been many earthquakes and, and natural disasters um, over the years haven't they throughout the world now the apostle Paul 
describes the world order as groaning and travailing in pain. If we look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 22. Here it says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. So it's like a woman waiting to be delivered of a child. And so it's evident then that our present troubles are the birth pangs of a new and a better world soon to begin. In both the Old and the New Testament we are told that the tribulation that will come at the end of human governments is the final herald of the second coming. And we are told how it will be a time of trouble such as never was. The time of Jacob's or, or Israel's trouble. Of great tribulation. So as that trouble increases. And God pours out his wrath upon the earth. There are indications that those true believers will be sheltered from this outpouring of trouble. We won't turn to these passages here but we can read of that in Isaiah. So we need to consider carefully then what uh, Jesus tells us. And he tells us in, in Luke, When these things become to pass, look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. So then what, what are some of the signs that we have of the coming kingdom? Well, there is one great sign for us which removes all doubt concerning Christ's imminent return. That's the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is, is back occupying the land promised by God. The history of the Jewish nation has been a guide throughout the ages to the outworking of God's purpose. They were called as a special people because of the great promises that had been made to their fathers. They were given the right to occupy the land that we know as Israel. It was conditional on their faithful obedience to God. They were the people whose kings occupied the throne of God's kingdom on earth. And as we've said already, they forfeited these rights when after centuries of indifference, they not only refused to accept the Lord Jesus as their Messiah, but they were actually involved with the Romans in effecting his death by crucifixion. And because of that rejection, Jerusalem was overthrown. Throughout the centuries, Jews have wandered the earth as a stateless people. They have been hated, they have been persecuted almost everywhere that they went. Just as it is told us in, in scripture. But scripture also forecast a better future for the nation. Not because they would change their behaviour and live to deserve better treatment, but because God would take pity on their plight and act. He would remember those great promises made of old to the fathers. And at the time of the end, we're told, they will be brought back from the nations and once more be settled in their own land, that land of promise. And the prophets have spoke about this in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel and in Zechariah. And so it came to pass that after nearly 2,000 years of dispersion, of downtreading, in 1948 the state of Israel was born by the decree of the United Nations. In 1967, Jerusalem was repossessed by the Jews. It had taken all that time for those words of Jesus to be fulfilled. So, everything now indicates that the times of the Gentiles are rapidly drawing to a close. The kingdom is coming. This bringing together of these troublous times and the return of the Jews to the land for us removes any doubt. Because shortly, 
Jesus will return to Jerusalem as a world ruler to reign over Israel and over all nations. And that, that's a subject that will be looked at um, from this place next Sunday, God willing. So of all the available signs of the times given by Jesus and the prophets, the establishment of Israel as a nation is one of the clearest signs that we have and witnesses that this time of the end is now nigh at hand. So Jerusalem is to play a significant part. Jerusalem is the, is the crossroads of the world. And every king, as we know, has a residence, a capital, a centre. And for God's kingdom, it's going to be Jerusalem. So we should watch carefully, then, events in Jerusalem when we look out for that coming kingdom. We know that this is going to be a superb capital. The kingdom of God is to be a world empire. Now there is another prophecy for us which speaks of the coming kingdom. The prophet Daniel interpreting a vision which forecast the successive empires of Babylon, of Persia, of Greece and Rome which were to be followed by a fragmented world of strong and weak governments such as we see in the world today. And this would lead to the coming of Jesus who is pictured in the form of a stone which descends and crushes these rebellious nations at the time of the end. And we're told about this in Daniel 2. The return of Jesus Christ and the takeover of the nations won't be accomplished without much resistance. And we have these passages which tell us about that resistance that Christ and his believers will come across from some of the nations. And we're also told what will happen about those who, who try and challenge Christ and his rule. So then, in the, in the dying moments of human governments, the powers of heaven will be shaken, men's hearts fail them for fear. The nations will be engaged in battle around Jerusalem, and then the Lord will come, unexpectedly, suddenly, in great power and glory, bringing salvation for those who have faithfully waited and prepared for this event in their lives. We are also told he will bring judgment on those who have willfully ignored those promises and that invitation of God. And we're told of that in uh, in Second Thessalonians chapter one. We just to those words there. Second Thessalonians and chapter one. Verse 9, it says, Who shall be punished with the everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So we need to watch and we need to wait for the coming kingdom. We need to heed the warnings that are given. Because these themselves are another sign that the coming kingdom is near. There will be those who would, who would scoff and say, where is the promise of his coming? Because the passing of time might seem by some as a failure of God by man. But God, we know, is not bound by time. And this seeming delay is actually the long-suffering of God we are told. He's not willing that any should perish. And we are told that God isn't slack concerning his promise. Uh, if we turn to Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter 3 and verse 3. Knowing this first that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts saying where is the promise of his coming 
For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. And then verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us ward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So as he will come as a thief in the night, so we need to be ready and waiting. And to help us with, with this, the Bible is our guidebook. It is our guidebook to the future. Just as it is our handbook now for the present. Because it alone is able to show us what God wants us to do. And from it we can learn God's purpose and his promises. The first thing is to understand and believe those things that are true. We will then come to appreciate the need for obedience to God which starts with baptism. We need to examine our lives now to ensure that we are watching and we are waiting. That we are prepared for the coming kingdom. So I encourage you to please read your Bible and to pray with all your heart. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven.